Uh, we are in a sermon series that we've titled The Resurrected Life. Uh, we're saying uh, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, it has massive implications on our lives. It has massive implications on those who have crossed the line of faith, those who look to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so we've just been making our way through the series, unpacking some golden nuggets uh, in the scriptures that tell us how we should live. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm making the point uh, that there is no better life than the resurrected life. Uh, that whatever it is that you are living and hoping for, whatever your ambitions are, uh, if you're trying to co compare them to the resurrected life, uh, they will always pale in comparison. Uh, the resurrected life is the most incredible life that you will ever live. And God, by grace, invites us to that life through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so my hope is that you would lean into that, uh, that you would forsake any other thing that you are running to, and that you would say, Jesus, you are my life and then lean into that and watch him work. Amen? All right, and so this morning we're going to continue part three of our series, uh, and I've titled it uh, this way. The, the resurrected life is a life of sowing and reaping. The resurrected life is a life of sowing and reaping. Now, I know many of you have probably heard that expression or that phrase uh, at some point in your life, right? Sowing and reaping. But I promise you this, that the sermon will not feel like you're watching an old man on TV sitting at a desk calling you to sow something into a ministry and that you will be blessed. That's, that's not what I'm going for, all right? I, I want to walk through Scripture and show us that, that this life of sowing and reaping is one that can be found in the Scriptures. It's one that God has put in our hands, that there is a law of sowing and reaping. There really is one. And from that law, we can extrapolate a theology of sowing and reaping. And if there is a theology, then there must be a discipline of sowing and reaping. A practice, a rhythm that you and I must have if we are going to be obedient to what God has called us to. The law of sowing and reaping. And so before we do that, permit me to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me that God would do that which only he can do. And that is save many, heal many, restore many, reconcile many, all for his glory. And so, Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have a revelation of who you are. That we don't have to imagine who you are. Lord, it's here, right in front of us. And so, God, would you reveal yourself to us this morning? Lord, as we jump into your scripture and we look at what it means to live a life of sowing and reaping, God, I pray that we would hear from you. That you would meet every single person here where they are. Open up our hearts, open up our minds. It's to that end, Lord, that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The resurrected life is a life of sowing and Reaping. Now, I know many of you might go, oh, Nate, you're saying that it's a law, you're saying that it's a theology, you're saying that it's a spiritual discipline, but where? Where in the Bible do you see that? And so, okay, let me answer that. And let me do so by starting right at the beginning. Right at the beginning. Because I believe in creation, God shows his hand on this matter. On the third day of creation, Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 to 12 Hear these words. God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Right out the gates. God is saying, listen, I, I am putting in a law. I'm establishing a practice of sowing and reaping. Take note of this. This is before sin ever enters into the world. That already there is a law of sowing and reaping. Why? Why would God do that? Well, it's because he wanted Adam and Eve to sow and to reap. Why would he then give seed-bearing plants if that were not the case? That this is part of them being fruitful and multiplying. 
that they were to take the fruit from the tree and eat it and then take the seed and plant it in the soil, water it, take care of it so that it might grow and bear more fruit. There is a law of sowing and reaping, and we see it at creation, before sin. But also, we see it after sin, in multiple places and in various ways. And so I'm going to do that in a few moments. I'm just going to unpack. I'm going to give you tons of scripture and tons of reasons. And and there'll be points where we'll stop and we'll unpack it a little bit and talk about how it applies for our everyday lives. And so, say with me. We see in the scripture God using the law of sowing and reaping to give blessing. To give blessing. And in some situations, his blessing is specific. It's specific and it's to specific people. But it comes through the law of sowing and reaping. Genesis 26 verse 12 and 13. It says this, And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in that same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. God blesses Isaac. He gives him wealth. But right there we see through the law of sowing and reaping. Friends, this should serve as a reminder to us that God can and do whatever he wants. He he gives blessing to who he wants. And he can give it in any shape or in any form. He does whatever pleases him. See, our call is to be obedient to what he says and then to stand back and watch him work. Too many of us find ourselves looking over there and looking over there and wondering, God, why aren't you doing what what you're doing over there? Why aren't you doing it with me? No, 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 no. The call is to be obedient. If the Lord calls you to sow, then you sow and you'll reap. And what you receive will be different to what others receive. We stand back and watch him work. He gives blessing through sowing and reaping. Israel's gratefulness for God's yearly blessing was expressed in what was called the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits, when, when the first of the harvest was brought to the Lord as an offering. That, that this idea of offering, offering to God is, is not a new thing. Now, I know a lot of people have hijacked it and, and, and have made millions off the back of their congregants, but, but it's in the scriptures and we are to practice it, We'd be, to be obedient to it. And so Israel, they, they show their gratefulness to God through the feast of the first fruits. Exodus 23 verse 19, as you harvest your crops, bring the very best of your first harvest to the house of the Lord your God. It's not a new thing. It's not on it being creative with words when I say we bring our first and our best. It's right here in the scriptures. In fact, it's in the Old Testament. Leviticus 23 verse 9 to 11 says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you enter the land I am giving you and you harvest its first crops, bring the priest a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest will lift it up before the Lord so it may be accepted on your behalf. It's a sign of of worship. It's it's our way of saying, God, you are in control. You are the giver of life. You are the giver of everything that we have. And so we give you our first and our best. Sowing and reaping. God also warned Israel. Israel. That if they chose disobedience and worshipped idols and false gods, the blessing of sowing and reaping would come to a halt. And their crops would fail. Leviticus chapter 26 from verse 14 to 17. In fact, the first 13 verses, I encourage you to go read it later. It's all about the blessings that we receive by being obedient. Because of our obedience, there is blessing, right? So that's the first part of Leviticus 26. But then from verse 14 to 17, he goes, but if you choose disobedience, verse 14, however, if you do not listen to me or obey all these commands, and if you break my covenant by rejecting my decrees, treating my regulations with contempt, and refusing to obey my commands, I will punish you. I will bring sudden terrors upon you. 
wasting disease and burning fevers that will cause your eyes to fail and your life to ebb away. And then hear this, you will plant your crops in vain because your enemies will eat them. That, that practice of sowing and reaping that, that we've been doing, God, that where we receive blessing, if we choose disobedience as we continue to sow, we will not receive the blessing. I will turn against you and you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will run even when no one is chasing you. How crazy is that? To, to be in a state of constant fear that you are running even when no one's chasing you. How, how many of you this morning live like that? Th those things that you are so concerned about, so consumed with, but in reality, have they ever happened to you? The law of sowing and reaping, and if we choose disobedience, and this happened a lot, sadly, it happened a lot, Jeremiah 12, 13, Micah 6, 15, literally, we can go page after page after page and see it. Obedience matters. It matters. But also, sowing and reaping has spiritual implications. It's not just an a agricultural principle. It's, it's not just a physical thing, but it has spiritual implications as well. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 to 8 says this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will will reap eternal life. We reap what we sow. That's the point that Paul is making there in Galatians. We reap what we sow. And it's, it's not just the physical, but it has spiritual implications as well. You reap what you sow. If you plant apple seeds, expect an apple tree. If you plant an orange seeds, expect orange trees. But, but here we are. We find ourselves planting an apple seed and hoping for an orange tree. And, and when people do that, two things are happening. Or we could say two things about them. One of two at least. Either you're a magician, which is just a fancy way of saying that you're an illusionist. You're a trickster. You're a liar. Unless some of you are sitting here and you believe that magic is real. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to, to break it to you. Magic is not real. It's an illusion. It is a trick. It is someone lying to you. They are misleading you. And so when you plant an apple seed and you're going, I'm expecting orange trees, then that means you're a magician. Or you're crazy. And so the question is, which one are you? Well, I'm sorry, that's a real question. Which, which, which one are you? If you're out here planting apple seeds, hoping for orange trees, then something is wrong. Because the Bible tells us we reap what we sow. Those who sow anger should expect to receive what anger naturally produces. Those who sow unforgiveness should expect to receive what unforgiveness naturally produces. Those who sow bitterness should expect to receive what bitterness naturally produces. Oh, now are you done? No, I've got more. Those who sow greed should expect to receive what greed naturally produces. Those who sow division, this is a big one. Those who sow division should expect to receive what division naturally produces. We're out here sowing division and then going, no, I'm expecting unity. S sowing greed and you're like, no, I'm expecting blessing. I'm expecting abundance. Can, can, can I go a little bit deeper here? I just said we're going to do a marriage maintenance workshop. There are some marriages in here who, who are standing back and going, God, 
why am I not receiving blessing and joy and peace and goodness and kindness? The question is, well, what are you sowing? Yeah. Anger, resentment, division. As the church, we've got to come to a place where, where we need to stop saying, oh, that was just so out of character. We hear it all the time. We hear it all the time on, 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 on TV and our, our favorite actors and actresses and musicians and celebrities. Like, they'll do something and then they'll go, oh, that was just so out of character for me. No, 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 hold on. Hold on. We should be asking people to show us their bonds and show us the seeds that they are planting. That was not out of character. That's what you've been doing. And then telling people, no, 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 I'm planting goodness. We should ask people to show us their hearts. Show us your heart. Let's take a closer look at what you're sowing. The church is full of performers and those who pretend. John chapter 15 Jesus talks to his disciples and he says that you must abide in me, remain in me, so that you might bear much fruit. Go read Isaiah chapter 5. God expects us to bear fruit. It's not an option. Some of us are here going, you know, if I have time, Jesus, then I'll bear fruit. If I can fit it on my calendar, then I'll bear fruit. There is an expectation. And because Israel couldn't do it, we needed a savior. And so Jesus steps in and he goes, okay, cool, I'll do it. I'll be the vine, you remain in me, and then you'll bear fruit. You will do that which God has called you to do. But even in that, we pretend and we perform. And we hide. You know how we hide? We, we take plastic fruit and then we stick it on ourselves and we go, look guys, look at me. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And it's tough these days. It's tough to tell what is, what is real and what is plastic. Sometimes we find ourselves going, I'm not 100% sure. So what I need to do is get a little bit closer. But then because we know that it's plastic, we go, no, 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 no. You're too close, man. You're too close. Huh? Social distancing. <laughs> COVID didn't just come up with social. We've been doing it for years as a way of hiding, pretending, so that we can perform. Because you know when people get up close, they'll be like, hey, this thing is not real. So, can I take a bite out of that fruit? No, 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 you can't. You can't. Uh, how the fruit works is... Uh, Fruit is meant to be enjoyed by others. It's meant to be shared. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. We reap what we sow. And so what are you sowing? There are consequences to our actions. I mean, the world operates under the law of cause and effect. There is no way around it. Every time we choose an action, we are also choosing consequences to that action. Every time. It's just some of us, every now and then we get away with it, and so we think, oh, this can become a practice now. Your time is coming. I see it as, as an act of grace from God to, if it's the first time you choose wrong, to experience the consequence. I know it sounds harsh, but hear me out. It's an act of grace to call you out in that moment the first time you do it. Because when you get away with it, then you just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And by the time it happens, the destruction that comes from it. Job chapter 4 verse 8. My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. Proverbs eleven eighteen. A wicked person earns deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. 
Proverbs 22, verse 8. Those who plant, those who sow, injustice will harvest disaster. And their reign of terror will come to an end. Watch them enjoy. But in light of eternity, that's only for a short time. Your destruction is coming. Hence, we preach the gospel. Hoping that people would turn from their evil ways. Turn from sowing evil and destruction. The scriptures are clear on this. And can I, just for a brief moment, talk to the leaders in the room? Because I think too often, and we're guilty of this, and myself included, we'll watch people sowing destruction and division and greed and bitterness, and then we'll just kind of stand back and and go, I hope it works out well for them. That's not what it means to be a leader. As they're doing that, our role is to come up behind them and go, no, no. No, no, I'm going to put goodness and kindness and faithfulness and then call them out and go, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Oh, you can't judge me. Well, you said you're a Christian. It's not judgment. I'm just, I'm just saying, hey, this is, this is like, if, how strange would it be if, if a doctor comes out and goes, hey, I don't want you to judge me on what I do in medicine. But, but you're a doctor. You say you're a doctor. How else am I supposed to evaluate your practice and your life? I'm a Christian. Okay. Then let's see your fruit. And as leaders, we're to come behind those who, and, and oftentimes they're young, they don't know, they're immature, and they're sinful, just like you and me. And so they end up planting seeds that they shouldn't. We take them out because if we don't, they will have an impact on the community. Every time. Every time. You'll walk up here on a Sunday and go, where did division come from? Oh, it's because we've been just watching people plant those seeds and do nothing. Because we don't get in people's business. That's not community. Community calls me. In fact, it commands me to be in your business. Sowing and reaping implies a season and a practice of waiting. This is a difficult one. This is a difficult one. But a farmer is a patient person. They're a patient person. They, they, they put the seed in the ground, put the gravel or the, the, the soil up on top, go in, go to bed, wake up the next morning, you come back, guys, nothing happened. At least it looks that way. You go back, next day, come back, again, it's like nothing, nothing happened. But that's, it's, it's such a difficult thing for us because we, we, we are the, the, the instant gratification generation. We are the microwave generation. This idea of sowing and reaping, we, we've done away with it because I want it here and I want it now and I want it easy. That's why many of us don't even sow and reap. And, like, we, just, we just don't. We're going, wake, wake, how, how can I make this easy for me? Be careful. Because if, if that's how you think, it won't be too long before you find yourself stealing. How else are you going to get it? Sowing and reaping implies a season and a practice of waiting. Waiting is a spiritual discipline. I wish I had time to unpack that one, but it is a spiritual discipline. We are the microwave generation. We are. I want it easy, I want it now, and I want it here. And and speaking to some of y'all in the room, if this resonates, then you know it's you. Because many of us are the first of something, the first to go to school, the first to have a full-time job, the first to buy a house, the first to buy maybe a second house, the first to build on my house, the first to own a car, the first to own a second car, the first to go on holiday. 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 Guys, holiday for me was the weekend. If I wasn't doing sports, that was a family, like, you're the first, and, and, and it's, not, it's not, like I'm not going, oh, it's because our parents didn't do, no, no, there were circumstances and realities and situations, I get it, but many of us are the first, but here's the problem, we want to be the first at everything now, 
You want to do it all in one generation. And you just can't. You, this is why we're burning out. You're trying to do everything. You're trying to do everything in one generation. Failing to recognize that, no, 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 I need to leave a farm spiritually. <laughs> Before someone says, oh, no, are you being political? No, no, no. I'm still in the spiritual realm here. <laughs> you you want to you leave a farm for your kids, kids, kids. Sowing and reaping is a generational thing. And so you go, here, here's what I'll do. Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this, and I'm going to be faithful with this so that I'll, I can hand over that thing to the next generation. It'll be so much better and, and so much bigger, and then they'll take on, and then they'll sow and be faithful, and so on, and so on, and so on. But to think that you can do it all in one generation, you will burn out, and then you will burn everything around you. You will burn your family, your relationships, your finances, you'll burn it all. It requires waiting and being faithful. Galatians 6 verse 9 says this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. At the right time. And that may not be in my lifetime. Let's, let's, just, let's just sit on that for a moment. It may not be in my lifetime. Who am I to tell God what the schedule is? We reap proportionately to what we sow. Here's the reality, natural and spiritual. The more seeds you plant, the more fruit you harvest. I, I, it's, I mean, I don't know how else to explain that one. And then the Bible applies this to our giving. Those who sow generously will be blessed way more than those who don't. One, is that really true? Oh, let me read some scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 8 says this. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. This is why we don't talk a lot about money here. And I think sometimes maybe we talk too little about it. But, but it's, it's connected to that. I'm, I'm not trying to, to manipulate you to giving. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide you, provide all you need then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Some of us, I feel like we're seeing that for the first time in our lives. You're like, wait, what? That is in Corinthians? You're saying that God says, if I give generously, if I sow generously, I will have everything that I need and I'll have plenty left over so others can share. Yeah, that's called kingdom economics. We're so tied to the, the economic structures of how this world works that we fail to see that there is kingdom economic. That God goes, hey, one plus one for God, it could equal whatever I want it to be. Will you sow generously? This principle is not concerned with the amount of the gift, but with the spirit in which it is given. God loves a cheerful, generous giver. And it's that word generous that sometimes we're like, mm, what does that mean? What, uh, hey, what does generous mean to you? What, what are you doing? How much, how much are you giving? I'm not sure. What is so let me give you a definition of generous. It's larger or more plentiful than what is usual or necessary. That's for you. You go home and figure out, so, so what is larger and more plentiful than what I usually give? When we look at the Old Testament, God was calling for 10%. We, we, can, we can comb through the scriptures. I can unpack if you're wrestling with that. You're like, oh, no, I don't believe it. Come chat to me afterwards. We'll, we'll talk about it. Then in the New Testament, we find a whole bunch of people going, you know what? Because of Jesus, it's not 10% anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. 
You're called to be generous now. And, and so 10% is like, that was like, hey, that's the standard. The call is now to be generous. And the fact that God only asks for 10%, I mean, God could have asked for 30%. He could have asked for 50%. God could have asked for 80%, knowing that he will still take care of you, he'll still provide for you, he's still yeah. got you. But because he's such a good God, he goes, you know what, 10, bro. And then Jesus shows up and he's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. you guys are asking, you're wrestling. It's almost like we think that these conversations we have are new. They're probably like, is it 10? I don't know, but what's What's 10? What exactly is first fruits? Like, what, is, what does that mean? I gave, he's, hey, be generous. Yeah. Be generous. Yeah. And when you are generous, God will provide for you. In fact, there'll be so much. There'll be the, the, the miracle of the young boy, the, they feed the 5,000. How many fish was it? How, many, how much bread was it? There we go. Read the rest of the story. Look at how it ends. We're told that there was leftovers. There was scuffed team. For the, and they started with what? Five, so, so, so the text tells us 5,000. But back then, they didn't, they didn't count the women and the children. They counted the men. So let's say 20,000 people were there. You so faithfully and generously. And you watch the Lord work. We see in Luke chapter 21, verse 2 to 3, here's what Jesus says about a poor widow. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. She was being generous with what she had. Now, in comparison to other people, sure, that's small. Most people would look and be like, that's nothing. No, 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 it's her heart. Her heart's in the right place. I've never heard of anyone who gave themselves into poverty. If you have, please come tell me about that person. And I'm referring to kingdom giving. I'm not talking about being foolish. I've never heard, I've never heard anyone say, guys, I just, I, I am so generous that I gave myself into poverty. In fact, it's quite the opposite. When I look at generous people, they're the people just going, I don't know what to, hey, on it. They'll, like, they'll call you, hey, man, I, like, God just did a thing, and I've just got all this extra. I don't know what to do with it. Do you know anyone who needs it? Uh, yes. Yes. And may the Lord continue to bless you. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. It says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. Here's why you can never give yourself into poverty. Because it's God who provides the seed. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. The, the seed belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. We, we've got to get this out of our minds that this stuff belongs to us. No, you're just a steward. God's just called you to be a good steward of it doesn't belong to you. We're like two-year-olds, mine, 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 mine. Like, God is like, no, it's mine. And by grace, I give it to you to be a blessing to others. Paul continues to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, from verse 11, he says, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. For the ministry of this service is not supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Did you guys hear that? That as we generously give, and here I want to go, Beyond money. Because here at Rooted Fellowship, we talk about giving of our time, our talents, and our treasures. As we give that way generously, people will come to see that God is real, that he is seated on his throne, that he's fully in control, and that he loves us more than we could ever imagine. 
and, and this, this giving of time, talent, and treasure, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not like I have three choices and I get to pick one. You give of your time and your talent and your treasure. You give your first and your best. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift too. God has placed us here, uniquely placed us here with the various gifts and talents that we have so that we might be a blessing to this community and a blessing to those who would walk into this community and all of this would be to the glory of our Father who is seated on his throne. This is why we sow. We sow our time and we sow our talents and we sow our treasures. We stand back and we watch. We watch God do the miraculous. But here's, here's the thing. Permit me if you will. If you've been coming to Rooted Fellowship for a while now and you call it home and you don't sow, I, I could talk about how that's disobedient and how that's not being faithful and that's not trusting God and all of those things are true. Um, but for the sake of time, let me talk about how disheartening it is to the rest of the community. To those who do sow their time and their talents and their treasures and do so faithfully. Now, I get it. I get it. Some of y'all are coming from really bad environments where you've been hurt, where you've seen this being practiced horribly, and I get it, and you just need to heal. You're welcome. Sit. Receive healing from the Father. But because he is a Father who heals, you're going to get to a point where you go, okay, I, I feel like I'm in a good place now. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to plug in. I'm ready to be a part of this community. And so you sow of your time and your talents and your treasures. Because when you don't, and yet you still enjoy the fruits of what God is doing here, after a while, it starts to feel like there is a camp of those who sow generously, and then there's a camp of those who just eat. They just show up and eat, and eat, and eat, and eat. And then after a while, it goes, man, you're not just eating, but now you're barking orders at those who are sowing. And so we move from being a, a community who, who God has in grace given us, remember spiritually, a piece of land. He's called us to this place and he says, listen, I want you to sow. You've got this gift, sow, sow this time, sow this treasure, sow. And then we watch the fruit and we watch the fruit and God increases and increases and increases. But then there's a few that are, they find themselves comfortably sitting down, feasting, 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 feasting. Barking out orders, and now it feels like you're on a horse and you have a whip. And you're just whipping your brothers and sisters. As you feast, you guys should do, you should do this. Oh, this is delicious. This is incredible. Hey, you guys should do this. Oh, this, this, this is fantastic. Friends, be careful. Be careful. You start to act like you're a master, but you're not a master. You don't own this. God does. God does. I'll give you one more illustration. How many of you have been stuck in traffic? Some of you are unsure what traffic is. So, like when you're in your car and you can't move and... So traffic, traffic. Um, man, I hate traffic. Like something evil comes out of me when I'm stuck in traffic. And you kind of know when it's going to happen, right? Like you're driving and, and, and all of a sudden you start slowing down and you can see and you're like, hey, I shouldn't have taken this road. And like you're, you're trying to figure out where's my phone, where's the GPS, maybe I can find a different way to, like it's so frustrating and then stop. And now we're all just sitting there. And then you get frustrated. And things start to build up inside of you. And you start thinking evil thoughts. I mean, you're like, now everyone around you is a horrible driver. You're even commenting on the other, like, the other, like, opposite direction. They got nothing to do with you. And you're just going, yeah, that one probably bought his license. Yeah, she definitely doesn't know how to, like, it's got nothing to do with you. You're just so frustrated. And maybe you're that person, I'm not this bold, but maybe you're that person who starts honking. You know, bah, bah. 
Hey, man, you, and maybe you're trying to get up on the curb. I don't know. I don't know if that's you. There's grace for you, right? <laughs> you're frustrated. And then eventually, as the traffic now starts to move a little bit, you get to see actually what was holding everyone back, and it was a horrendous accident. Now, I feel like such a loser in that moment. Because there are people who are tr- they're trying to serve. They're trying to make sure that the traffic continues. They're trying to save lives. See, see many of us, we're, we're so far away from what's going on. That it's easy for us to just... Bah, bah. <laughs> you guys suck. Come on. Maybe, maybe God's calling you to get out of your car. And walk a couple of meters and go see what's going on. And and who knows? Imagine you're a doctor. The accident has just happened and that's what they're desperately needing. You're too comfortable in your car. That you're not willing to take that step out of comfort and go and be a part of what's going on. The saving work. Guys, if, if I have time, I'll take you to the gospel. Jesus stepped out of heaven out of the comfort of heaven and came to where the mess was and got involved. Scripture tells us that when we sow, we actually reap more than what we sowed, which tells us that the law of sowing and reaping is connected to the law of multiplication. Jesus spoke of the parable of the sower the four types of soil, Matthew 13. And in that parable, he ends with the seed that fell on fertile soil. And, and then what does he say about them? He's, Matthew 18, verse 8, he says, Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. The, the law of sowing and reaping is connected to the law of multiplication. One grain of wheat produces a whole head of grain. In the same way, in the same way, one little untruth can produce an out of control whirlwind of lies, errors, and misrepresentations. That's why it matters what you sow. It's not just in the positive, but in the negative as well. You think it's one little lie. You come back next week, and man, it's chaos here. Sowing. And reaping is used as a representation of death and resurrection. When Paul discusses the doctrine of the resurrection of the body, he uses the analogy of planting a seed to illustrate physical death. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 to 44. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. Friends, the law of sowing and reaping is real. And it matters. It should matter to you. If you have crossed the line of faith, if you are seeking to live out of the resurrected life, it should matter to you. Now, I've said a lot. I've said a lot. But then the question is, how is all of this possible? How is any of this possible? The gospel. The gospel makes it possible. How how am I a selfish human being? How am I able to sow generously the gospel? How, How does God take something small and multiply it beyond what our minds could even comprehend? The gospel. The gospel is the answer to all of it. Jesus Jesus says this in John chapter 12, verse 23 to 24. He says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He's talking about his death and resurrection that's coming. Truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, if it dies, it produces much fruit, a plentiful harvest of new lives. That's what it produces. Jesus' death and resurrection produces a harvest of new lives. This is why this is a spiritual discipline for those who cross the line of faith. He then turns to us and says, my death and resurrection has, has uh, implications for you. If we continue to read John chapter 12, from verse 25, he says this, the one who loves his life, the so-called good life, the one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates 
his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servants also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. You want the Father to honor you? Serve Jesus, follow Jesus. The resurrection life is one of sowing and reaping. It is, it just is. And, and what I've given you is not even half of what the Bible has to tell us. But, 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 but for the sake of time, let me land the plane and let me call the band up. And, and I want to land the plane by, by, by answering the so what. So what, on eh? What does this mean? You've said a lot. Time, talents, treasure. Give generously. Don't just be that person who enjoys the food. You've said a ton. I hope you listen to this message again. You've said a lot. So what? Let me tell you. God has blessed this community more than you could ever imagine. He really has. The fact that we planted two churches during COVID blows my mind. It just does. We don't have a lot but we so faithfully and we so generously. And so I believe that this community God has blessed more than you could ever imagine. I believe sitting here in this very room, we have schools that don't exist yet. We have businesses that don't exist yet. We have hospitals that don't exist yet. We have community initiatives that don't exist yet. We have financial institutions that don't exist yet. They're sitting here they just haven't been sown yet. They are churches that don't exist yet. And God is just going, I'm waiting for you to sow. So faithfully. So generously. When will you sow? And for many of us, it's just flat out disobedience. I am so concerned with my own life. I'm that doctor in the car, stuck at the back of the, just going, you know, it's none of my business but I'm going to enjoy. And then for many of us, it's, it's fear. We have the evil one whispering in our ears, going, well, what you have is not enough. What you have is not good enough. You're not good enough. You don't have the words. You don't have the intellect. And so I want to pray. I want to close out by praying. Praying for those two groups. The disobedient, you know what God has called you to. The gospel demands a response. We say this every week. And then those who are just living in fear. You, you simply living. They are, they are, don't raise your hand. Don't, don't raise your hand, but raise it in your heart. How many of you have investment accounts? Again, in your heart. Okay, you've raised them. How many of those are doing really well, right? Despite COVID and everything, they're doing really well. Okay, great. That means that you have a gift of sowing and reaping because that's what investing is. But here's the thing. You're going, well, how, how do I become a blessing? It's not just about giving, but what else can I do? Hey, the, the church has a bank account and um, we have some money in it and you're gifted at investments. Well, why don't you come and help us figure out how we could invest and just do better with the money that God has given us? We just want to be better stewards. There are various ways. So some of y'all are graphic designers. It's not just greeting at the door. Like, there are various ways that you can sow here. Some of you have wisdom, wisdom in years. Sow that. And so I'm going to pray. And as I pray, my hope is that we would respond. And as you hear these words, you would ask yourself, God, where am I in light of all of this? I've heard that there is a law of sowing and reaping. Therefore, there is a theology of sowing and reaping. Therefore, there is a spiritual discipline of sowing and reaping. But I'm holding on to so much, and I have not sown one thing. Lord, make me a generous person. And so, eyes closed, heads bowed. Father, you are faithful, you are trustworthy, I can and do trust you. Your plans toward me are good. All things work together for my good, even in times when I don't see it or believe it. Lord, I have heard from your word. Let it dwell 
in me richly. Let it come alive and embolden me to do that which you have called me to do. Too often I fail to move because I am chained by fear. Fear is not an emotion but a spirit. And God, for those in Christ, you have not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. I have heard your law of sowing and reaping, and I confess there are times when I don't obey this commandment because I don't believe it or believe it as I ought to. I don't believe you will provide for me. I don't believe you know what's best for me. I don't believe you have a good plan and purpose for me. And all of this is rooted in the sad reality that I don't believe you love me. All of this is a lie driven by the father of lies himself. And so, here and now, in the name of the magnificent, matchless, undefeated name of Jesus, I rebuke and cast down the spirit of fear in my own life. Today and forever, Satan, you are a liar and a deceiver, and I call you out by one of your names, spirit of fear, come out. You are cast down, you are ejected, you are expelled. Father, I praise you for my salvation, my deliverance, my ongoing sanctification. I cling to the promise that he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion. I trust you with my heart and soul. I surrender to you. I entrust all of me to you. My ambitions, my emotions, my dreams, my desires, my talents, my time, my treasures, my everything. Holy Spirit, I invite you in the areas where the spirit of fear seeks to occupy and I ask you to bring love, power, and self-discipline. Let rivers of living water flow in those areas of my life, especially in the areas that have become comfortable with stagnation, laziness, and indifference. Move me towards obedience and faith. Like the elders in Revelation, I cast my crown down at your feet. All I have and all that I am means nothing if not placed in your sovereign, loving hand. Father, I ask that you would stand guard to the entrance of my heart. If I am to be captivated by anything, let that be in awe of you. Protect me. Watch over me. The enemy prowls like a roaring lion seeking to devour me and all that you have planned for me to walk in. But Lord, would your word remind me that he, Satan, my adversary, has been defeated, declared a loser, and he, death and sin, no longer have a grip on me. Lord, I pray that everything my hands touch multiply. That generosity would flow from my heart because of the overwhelming generosity that I have already received in the gospel and continue to receive through grace upon grace. I freely, cheerfully, and generously give of my first and best because, God, you have given me your first and best in your Son, Jesus Christ. And so align my vision to yours. Make me a faithful and expectant sower. Let every gift you have given me go into the ground in faith and in due time, according to your plan, bear much fruit for your kingdom to expand and to be enjoyed in this generation and the next. God, you delight in me because of Jesus. Help me to believe that and therefore live out of it. You have blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You chose me before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. You predestined me for adoption, to be a child of the kingdom, a child with a purpose, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which you created ahead of time for me to do. Let me sow those good works faithfully and generously for your glory. You had plans for me to sow and reap long before I knew what sowing and reaping was. And now you expect me to act in faith. Spirit, lead me. Regardless of what happens in this life, I know where my hope lies. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and I I have waiting for me an imperishable inheritance. It's guaranteed. Father, I am called. Help me know the hope of that calling and the immeasurable power that dwells in all who believe. I sow in that power, the resurrection power 
the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Lord, I look forward to that harvest. Plenty, abundant, full of joy. All glory to you, God, who is able through your mighty power at work within me to accomplish infinitely more than I might ask or think. Glory to you in the church, in Christ Jesus, through all generations, forever and ever. Amen.